Okay, in this video, I'm going to look at orthogonal sets of functions. So we'll give the definition quickly, and then we'll give, do a, a specific example showing that a, a set is an orthogonal set. So we say a set of functions, phi1 of x, phi2 of x, etc. This is an orthogonal set of functions on the interval a to b if any two functions in the set are orthogonal to each other. And I should say any two distinct functions. So we look at their inner product. And again, to find the inner product, we just multiply them together, integrate over the specified interval. And it says if that equals 0, it says those two functions are orthogonal. Okay, so let's do a specific example here. Let's show that the set 1 comma cosine x, sine x, cosine 2x, sine 2x, cosine 3x, sine 3x, 3x, etc. These form an orthogonal set on the interval negative pi to positive pi. And this is an important set of functions because this is the set that we use when we talk about Fourier series. Okay, so here we're going to have to really show, I'm going to break it down into cases. We could take 1, and then we could take the inner product of any cosine function. We would have to show that that's 0. Likewise, we could take 1 and match it up with any of the sine functions. We would have to show that that's 0, their inner product. And then we could take any cosine function and find the inner product with any other distinct cosine function and show that's 0. The same thing with our sine functions. We would have to show that if we take any two distinct sine function in there, that we get 0. And lastly, we could take a cosine function, and we could take a sine function. Okay, and we have to show that those are equal to 0. So here, n's not going to equal m. Likewise, n's not going to equal m. Here, it doesn't matter if they're the same or not. Okay. So I'm going to show these first two cases, and I'll pick one of these uh, last three cases to show as well. All you're doing to integrate is you're just using trig identities. So to do a couple, you know, I'm going to use trig identities in a couple parts to justify. But again, other than that, it, it's really, I think the worst part is just the fact that you have all these cases. So to show the, uh, the inner product of 1 and cosine of nx is 0, well, we would integrate from negative pi to positive pi. We would take 1 times cosine of nx dx. Well, to integrate this, I mean, you could just use a u substitution. u is nx, du would be n dx. So 1 over n du, that's going to be our dx. So the antiderivative, we would just be left with 1 over n times sine of nx. And then we have to evaluate that from negative pi to positive pi. All right, well, if we substitute in, we have sine of n times pi minus sine of, we would have n times negative pi. So I'll write that as negative n times pi. And now the observation, right, inside, these are just some multiple of pi. And if you, you know, if you evaluate, for exa example, sine of 0 pi or 1 pi or 2 pi or 3 pi or 4 pi, no matter what, if you take sine and evaluate it at a multiple of pi, these always equal 0. So, hey, we're left with 1 over n, 0 minus 0, and we get 0 just like we want it. Okay, the same thing. So let's do the next case I had listed here. So negative pi to positive pi, we'll take 1 times sine of nx dx. Well, the antiderivative here will get 1 over n. The antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. And then we would have nx, and again, just evaluating this from negative pi to positive pi. So we've got negative 1 over n. We have cosine of n times pi minus cosine of negative n times pi. And now I'm going to make use of the fact that cosine is an even function. So since cosine's even, recall one of the identities says that cosine of negative theta, that's simply going to be the same thing as cosine of theta. 
So I'm going to use this identity on my second term. And if I do that, it says we'll be left with negative 1 over n. It says I'll have cosine of n times pi minus. This basically says you can just get rid of the negative. So minus cosine of n times pi. Well, we've got cosine of n pi minus cosine of n pi. That again is clearly going to give us 0. Okay, so we've got two cases down. I'm going to pick on uh, one of these last three. I don't know which one do I want to do. Um, maybe I'll just go ahead and, uh, um, I don't know, I'll pick on the very, I'll pick on the middle one. Why not? Okay, so I'm going to show that the inner product of sine of nx and sine of mx, that's going to give us 0. And the other two examples I'm not going to show, or the other two cases I'm not going to show, you, you do them the exact same way. So I've got negative pi to positive pi. I have sine of nx times sine of mx dx. And again, we want to show that this is 0. So the identity that I'm going to use, and you may, if you've forgotten some of these, you may need to look them up, but I'll go ahead and write this one down. It says that if you have sine of theta times, say, sine of phi, it says that's going to give you an equivalent identity is 1 half. It says we take cosine of theta minus phi minus cosine of theta plus phi. Okay, so I'm going to make use of this identity. Okay, so it says we've got negative pi to positive pi. We would have 1 half. And now, you know, instead of theta and phi, we've got nx and mx. So we would have cosine of nx minus mx minus cosine of nx plus mx. And just integrating all of that with respect to x. So we can factor the 1 half out. I'm going to do one other thing as well. I'm going to factor the x out. So we've got cosine of n minus m times x minus cosine of n plus m times x. Put our dx out there. And now if we integrate, we've got 1 half. So the antiderivative of cosine of n minus m of x, that's going to be 1 over n minus m. Then we would have sine of n minus m of x. And for our next one, we would have 1 over n plus m. And then we would have sine of n plus m of x. Okay, so I guess I'll substitute it in, but we're really just going to use the same argument as we did a second ago when we talked about multiples of pi. But... Okay, so we've got 1 half, I would have 1 over n minus m, I would have sine of n minus m, let me put in my upper limit of pi, minus 1 over n plus m, sine of n plus m of pi, so there's our upper limit of integration, minus uh, our lower limit of integration, so we would have 1 over n minus m, sine of n minus m, and in this case, uh, that's being multiplied by negative pi, minus 1 over n plus m, and then we would have n plus, whoops, got ahead of myself, um, we would have 1 over n plus m multiplied by sine of n plus m, and then multiplied by negative pi. So you can see this is why I'm not doing all the cases, because... It's just so long. Um, okay, so sorry about my, my little typo there. But again, all we're really doing, you know, if you think about sine of, say, n minus n times pi, or sine of n plus m times pi, or sine of n minus m times negative pi, or sine of n plus m times negative pi, in each case, you're just evaluating sine of some multiple some multiple of pi in each case, right? Because n is a natural number, m is a natural number, n minus m is going to be at least an integer. 
And so again, we're just getting some multiple of pi. And in every single case, we're just going to be left with 0. So sine of n minus m of pi, that's all 0. n plus m of pi, that's all 0. Uh, this term, n minus m times negative pi, that'll be 0. Sine of n plus m of negative pi, again, that's 0. So all you're left with is 1 half times 0, which is clearly going to give you 0. So, all right, I'm going to leave it right there. I've done most of the cases for you now. And again, all you're doing on the, uh, the other two, exact same thing. You're just using trig identities uh, to help you integrate it. And then it should be pretty straightforward. Either use the fact that cosine's even. Um, you should be able to give some, some pretty straightforward argument about why everything is, in fact, zero. So again, this is a very important orthogonal set of functions because we'll see this when we start talking about Fourier series.